talk about a few examples of where science uh, apparently leaves the confines of the lab and ends up having an impact out in society. So there are probably some surprising examples. So uh, this woman coming up now is Mary Claire King. So you probably don't know her name, I guess you don't recognize her, but I'm certain that you do know her work because Mary Claire King did her PhD with a man called Alan Wilson and together they were the first ones to show that human and chimp are 99% identical at the DNA level. This was their work. So if you've ever worn a t-shirt like this, if you've seen a t-shirt like this and got the joke, it's because actually without necessarily knowing Mary Claire King by name, you actually do know her work. Another person who you probably haven't heard of but whose work you know is Janet Lane Clapin. So she was um, active in the, about the 1920s. She was the first one who showed that breast milk is better than cow's milk for the development of babies. But she's also credited with being a pioneer of epidemiological studies because she worked in uh, looking at breast cancer and she found it's very complicated, a lot of things contribute to it. But she also noticed kind of a peculiarity was that it tended to cluster in some families. So this was basically the first observation that breast cancer is sometimes genetic. So back to Mary Claire King, after she finished her PhD in 1974, 40 years ago, she decided to start looking at the genetics of breast cancer and she set herself the project of trying to find genes responsible for breast cancer. At this particular time, the prevailing wisdom was that cancer was viral and not genetic, so she was going against the trend. Also, there were no human ge disease genes mapped of any kind. It would take almost 10 years before the first one was. There was no genome sequence. We didn't even really know what number of genes there are in the human genome, so it was a really difficult challenge. This is the human genome printed out in the Wellcome Trust Museum in London. It's 3.3 uh, billion letters long. It takes 87 volumes over approximately 12 shelves, and that's when it's printed in four-point font, so it's huge. So she didn't have any access to this information. What they did have was this basic knowledge that as chromosomes get passed down through the generations, they do get mixed and scrambled, but if things are closer together, they tend to stay together. So this is called linkage mapping. And basically she's using milestones or landmarks along the genome and trying to say, well, is this is this characteristic, which is the tendency towards the disease, is it linked or is it close to some of these milestones in the genome? And so using this approach, so starting in 1974, basically her lab working on its own, they initially found that there's something on chromosome 17, so they localized to a chromosome. And then by 1990, so 16 years later, they would got narrowed it down to quite a small region on chromosome 17. So if we put this into a little bit of context, if you consider the distance from Houston Station to Strad Valley as the total human genome, she said it's in the minefield arena. So now it was clear it's somewhere close. And this is the point at which it became a race. So until now it had been Mary Claire King's lab, her researchers only. At this point it was over a hundred researchers worldwide working full tilt in about a dozen labs around the world. And so this was the, the, the race to find the first breast cancer gene. Unfortunately, Mary Claire King lost the race. It was won by work, people who work in this company, Myriad Genetics. They were the ones who found the gene, even though Mary Claire King was almost there. This was a shame for her personally, but it also meant that um, these guys, Myriad, had the opportunity to patent the gene, which they did. So they patented the breast cancer gene, BRCA1, um, because they were the first ones who found it, which meant even though it's naturally occurring, they effectively own the rights to it. So anybody who wanted to get tested to know whether they carried this gene and perhaps take preventative measures or um, have precautionary tests or surveillance, if they wanted to get the test, it cost a lot, lot more than it would have cost just because of the license that needed to be paid to the company. Last year, only last year, so that's uh, 19 years after the gene was found, the US Supreme Court struck out this patent and they said that any naturally occurring gene cannot be patented. So since last year, the costs have come right down. This is just a, a by the way, there was a film made about, um, partly about the search for the breast cancer gene and Helen Hunt played Mary Claire King, which has to be pretty cool. Anyway, so this is, so it's 20 years ago, 40 years ago that Mary Claire King started searching for the gene, 20 years ago next month, that it was found. Also next month is Ada Lovelace Day. This is Ada Lovelace. She happened to be Byron's daughter, but she was also the first ever computer programmer because uh, she, pr she made algorithms for Charles Babbage's difference machine. So this day is um, used to recognize women in science who deserve a bit more recognition. So my proposal is that Mary Claire King is a wonderful scientist who's done a lot of stuff that's left the lab and had a huge impact on society and that she's definitely worthy of some more recognition. So thank you very much.